Welcome, Emily, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, the program. As uh, Megan, in her introduction, said, we're going to talk about um, about two books. Uh, Emily St. John uh, Mandel has written five novels so far, two of which have been translated into Dutch. Her fourth novel, her breakthrough novel, Station Eleven, Station Elf, and as Megan has showed us, uh, The Glass Hotel at Glazen Hotel, her most recent book. But Emily, I would like f uh, first, uh, I would like to talk about, let's say, your background. You're a Canadian author living in New York. Um, can you tell me something about how this came about? I understand you were born in a, on a small island. I grew up in a small island near uh, British Columbia in, uh, uh, in, in the west of, of Canada and came to uh, New York via Toronto. What happened? All right. How did we get here? Um, yes. that, that's correct. Uh, I was born on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. So if you look at a map of Canada, it's the, sliv the sliver of land to the very extreme west. Um, lived there till I was 10. Then we moved to Denman Island, British Columbia, which if anybody's read Station Eleven, that is the island in the book. I fictionalized it so lightly. It's really exactly as I described it. A very rural, very small, very beautiful place. Um, when I was a child, I was homeschooled. And what that meant was that I had an enormous amount of time to read. And there was a period of time when I was about eight or nine years old, when one of the requirements of the curriculum was that I had to write something every day, a little short story or a poem or something along those lines. And I don't mean to imply that it was good. You know, these were little poems about daffodils and cats. Um, but it got me in the habit of writing from a very early age. When I was a child, I really wanted to be a dancer. So I trained very intensively in ballet. It, there was this very, in retrospect, kind of odd and congruous thing, which is there was a fantastic ballet school about 45 minutes down the road on Vancouver Island. So I trained quite intensively until I was about 18 when I auditioned successfully for the School of Toronto Dance Theater, which is a um, conservatory program in contemporary dance in Toronto, Canada. And, I, I, you know, I went through that program. I danced professionally very briefly. And I had a moment when I was about 21 or 22 when I realized I didn't love it anymore. That had been my life, uh, my entire life since I was a kid. And somehow along the way, I just lost all of the joy in it. It was, um, it really felt like more of a chore than a pleasure which kind of raised the obvious question, well, now what? Um, and it was around that time that I began thinking of taking the writing more seriously. I'd kept up writing all those years just as a hobby, never showed that work to anybody. And for me, it was a gradual process of going from thinking of myself as a dancer who wrote as a hobby to thinking of myself as a writer who still went to the occasional dance audition to just really committing absolutely to the writing. So in my early 20s, I began writing what became my, my first novel, Last Night in Montreal. Right. And then in terms of the geography, I was born and raised in Canada, but my father was originally American. He grew up in Southern California and uh, immigrated to Canada after the Vietnam War. So. I'd actually had American citizenship from birth, and I have dual citizenship. So, um, yeah, so it was quite easy, ultimately, to come to New York. I was living in Toronto. I, um, my boyfriend at the time lived in New York, so I moved to New York to be with him. We moved up to Montreal together, and it was an unmitigated catastrophe, although I did get a novel out of it. And, right. then, um, and then I came back to New York by myself, and that was 17 years ago. Time goes quickly. So, yeah, yeah I, I've been living, um, you could say, as a Canadian in New York or as a dual citizen in New York for, uh, yeah, for really a long time at this point. Your father being American, uh, there wasn't much of a, of a culture shock for you moving to the U.S. I find the culture shock, you know, it is there. They're not vastly different countries. And I think most Canadians would be mortally offended to hear me say that, but it's true. These are not wildly cultural different, culturally different places, but the cultural differences do exist. If you grow up in a country with very strict gun control laws, as Canada has, then I cannot express the shock of living in the United States where 
you know, too many Americans of my acquaintance, not all, but too many, seem to view gun violence as something almost like the weather. Like, you know, tornadoes are terrible, but what are you going to do? Um, whereas I come from a country that had a problem and solved it by means of legislation. So, yeah, th things like that come up sometimes. Um, healthcare, of course, that's, that's a big one. I've lived in the United States for most of my adult life at this point. I absolutely cannot wrap my head around the healthcare system. It just seems insane to me. So th there are these cultural differences, but, but yeah, you know, to your point, um, they're not, for the most part, you know, aside from a few issues like that, um, it's not a shockingly different place. Yeah. Now you, you live in New York, in, in, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, we can't, uh, I suppose, uh, go around the question like, how, how's your present situation? We've heard a lot of news and uh, in the news and all about New York, the situation in New York. So, well, a, a personal update that would be appreciated. Right, right. Thank you yeah. for asking. Um, the situation for the city has been dire in this pandemic. Oh. The numbers are staggering. You know, in all of the talk about flattening the curve, what sometimes gets lost in that is the reality, which is that that flat top of the curve can be a devastatingly high plateau. So there was a period of time, actually most of April, uh, when it was just constant ambulance sirens day and night. And uh, the numbers were so terrible. Now, there was at least a week when almost 800 people were dying here every single day. So for me, though, it's been this strange... Um, this strange thing where there's this awareness of external catastrophe, you, know, you can't avoid it. Um, a few of our friends have gotten sick at this point, uh, none seriously, thank goodness. But, yeah. you know, it's kind of all around us in the outside world. At the same time, the day to day is quite tranquil. And it's a little bit strange to say that you can get used to this, but you can, you can get used to it, anything. So my day-to-day -day life, um, I live with my husband and our four-year-old daughter, who will probably crash this event, by the way. And, um, you know, we trade off working with childcare throughout the day. I take a shift, he takes a shift, we switch back. Groceries come in once a week. We have a really lovely rooftop terrace with a container garden that I've been building up for years. So I've been spending a lot of time gardening. So, you know, day-to-day, -day, it's fine. It, uh, it hasn't been that bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it possible at all, uh, apart from the fact that you have a four-year-old in the house and, and you have to keep her busy and all that, uh, homeschooling and everything, but apart from that, you know, is the whole psychological situation, does it allow you to do any writing at all? I had a lot of trouble with that in April. Um, it, you know, it, it seemed to me that every time I came to my desk, I would hear another ambulance siren. And I'd have these moments of thinking, wait, how many sirens am I listening to simultaneously? And it often seemed like several. And during that time, it was often not possible to write. It's, it's hard not to imagine the person gasping for breath in the back of the ambulance is the reality of it. So that was difficult. It's gotten easier lately. Um, partly just the sort of slightly troubling reality that one can get used to anything. And, and also there are fewer sirens. The numbers are getting better. So right. yeah. yeah, I think it's that combination of things. Lately I have been working. Right. Well, as it happens, uh, six years ago, obviously you published Station Eleven, uh, which was about a, a pandemic. Maybe for those of us who haven't uh, yet read the book, uh, could you tell us something about the nature of that pandemic and perhaps uh, how it is related, or well, or compare it maybe to the present situation of the corona pande pandemic, pandemic, sorry, we're, uh, we're suffering now? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, I have to say the pandemic in Station Eleven was quite a bit worse. There was, uh, there was a wild mortality rate in the book, something like 99.9%. .9%. And really my thinking with that book was... I wasn't really interested in writing about a pandemic per se, or even really about the collapse of civilization. The project there was I was interested in writing about a post-technological world. But yeah. of course, that requires collapsing civilization and you have to end the world somehow, which is why there was a pandemic. In terms of how they differ, I suppose you don't really know something until you live through it. And there are a couple of things that I just hadn't thought of in my fictional pandemic. One was that when I was writing Station Eleven, and even in all of my reading about the history of pandemics, 
I was thinking of them in very in a very binary way, in a sort of as almost like an on off switch. Like you're either in a pandemic or not in a pandemic. But something that was quite fascinating and kind of haunting in the approach of the Corona pandemic was that atmosphere of creeping dread when a pandemic is approaching. And that was something that I just hadn't considered as a reality of living through this. Those days when you're reading the news, it seems obvious that something's coming. And yet there is this kind of denial at play. There were weeks in New York where we knew what was coming. New York City has three international airports. We kind of assumed that it was spreading through the city. And yet there was this odd cognitive dissonance where we were still taking our children to school. And that kind of haunts me in retrospect. And it's something that I hadn't really considered in writing my fictional pandemic. No. Something, something else that didn't occur to me, you know, there's such a wild mortality rate in the pandemic in Station 11. It would not have occurred to me that an illness with a mortality rate as low as COVID-19 seems to have. Um, could create such an incredible disruption over society. Oh. And what it makes me realize is that a mortality rate doesn't have to be particularly high for a civilization to waver, which is slightly terrifying and something that I hadn't considered. Yeah, next time you you, you might stop at 40% or something. Uh, I might, I might, yeah, 40 would do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, I think uh, in the US you got very varied reactions presently. I mean, uh, uh, let's say last, in the last couple of months, Mm -hmm. uh, on, on this book, although it's six years old. I think some people reacted rather aggressively, didn't they? <laughs> they did. Uh, there was a period of time when quite a few people in my Twitter feed seemed quite angry that they'd chosen to read a book about a pandemic during a pandemic. Um, you know, my feeling was, well, you know, the back cover does say that it's, that it's about a pandemic. You know, nobody was hiding information here. Um, yeah, but there was a bit of that. I found, though, that by the end of March, people had gotten that out of their systems. You know, those people had sent their tweets and moved on with their lives. And since then, I'd say reaction has been uh, mostly positive. I, I think that some people are drawn to reading that book during a pandemic because it is ultimately a hopeful novel. Yeah. There's, also, there's also an idea that perhaps we shouldn't always turn to literature for comfort. You know, perhaps that's also a way to face head on our darkest fears. And... I think that's why people are reading pandemic novels now and why movies like Steven Soderbergh's Contagion um, are suddenly quite popular. So yeah. it's interesting to see. Uh, for myself, I would not personally read a pandemic novel during a pandemic. Yeah. Now, six years ago, this was your breakthrough novel. Do we have any, any explanation for the fact that this novel apparently uh, hit such a huge, well, got such a huge attention and interest that so many people thought, well, yeah, we should read this, we should buy this. Right. I don't. There is such an element of mystery and luck, I would say in publishing, but really in all of the arts, where it's such a subjective world. So much comes down to luck. And to be clear, that's not to denigrate my novel. I believe in Station Eleven. But what I also believe is that any number of novels published that year were at least as good and found a fraction of the readership. And I don't know that there's any real explanation for that. You know, you could say it was a good book, but so were all those other books that, you know, sold uh, a very few copies. There's just such luck involved, uh, novels in the right place at the right time, uh, the extremely subjective little group of, uh, of people who make up an awards jury decide to nominate it. Um, yeah, it's, it feels to me like something akin to having drawn a winning lottery ticket. Right. Yes. You know, in the sense that, um, you know, I feel it's, it's almost obscenely fortunate. And, um, and yeah, that's, it, there, there's so much luck involved, I think, is the truth of it. And you were awarded the, uh, the Arthur C. Clarke Award, which is actually for science fiction. Was that something like, gives me an uneasy feeling because I'm sort of, uh, deep, well, put into a sort of, well, let's say in the, in the sci-fi department, whereas maybe that's not what your aim was. Right. Um, yeah, the question of genre, it can be so subjective and slippery. My first three novels were marketed as literary fiction in North America, but I was marketed as a thriller writer in France. So I would go to these festivals in France right. and, you know, sit next to the guy who wrote Three Days of the Condor, which I would think of as a different genre, but... Mm -hmm. 
it's uh, it is so subjective. Yeah. An idea that I came across around the time that Station Eleven came out was explicated by Joshua Rothman in The New Yorker. And he made what I think should be an obvious point, but sometimes isn't, which is that, of course, a book can be more than one genre. And, yeah. you know, it's, it seems obvious, but we have such a tendency as a species to, uh, to put things in their own narrow silos. You know, it's one or zero, black or white, sci-fi or literary fiction. I love the idea that it's both. So I don't really like it when I'm categorized as, it sounds so pejorative to say just a sci-fi writer. I really enjoy science fiction, but I like the idea that a book can be more than one thing. Yeah. There's one a character in the in the book. She's called Miranda, and she's uh, like you. She's from a, a, a small island uh, in, in, uh, in British Columbia. Um, and uh, actually, she provides uh, the title of the novel. She has uh, written, uh, or she's working, during the novel, she's working on uh, a graphic novel called Station Eleven. Uh, could you tell us something about what actually this, um, uh, this novel, or this graphic novel, what actually, what, what it is, and why you chose to, uh, to name it, to use it as the title of your book? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, Originally, when I was writing Station Eleven, the graphic novel was quite unimportant. I was just thinking of it through the lens of Miranda's character. I had a very clear idea of her from the beginning as this person who'd graduated from art school, therefore found it necessary to take on an administrative job, which as the graduate of a program in contemporary dance was something I knew a great deal about. And then the situation of practicing one's art around the margins of the job, which of some, probably the overwhelming majority of artists experience at some point or another. So I was just thinking in terms of, well, what's her art going to be? I liked the idea of it being something she could practice at her desk. So no painting or sculpture. I really like graphic novels. I think they're an interesting way to tell a story. So I thought, I know, she'll be a graphic novelist. And then I didn't really think that much more of it. But as I was revising the book, I realized that I'd created this kind of accidental parallel between the world of the graphic novel and the world of you know, the overarching novel, where in the Station Eleven comic books, they're about a small group of people marooned on a space station, which is to say marooned in a world that they never could have imagined, which is, of course, the situation of the people in the novel. You know, they're marooned in this future that would have seemed improbable, that, that, um, that sense of being marooned in a strange world. Right. So... Uh it began to seem to me that I could use the comic books as a way of amplifying that sense of alienation and strangeness. And because all genres have different rules, you, could have, you can have a character in a comic book stand there and say, as Dr. Eleven does, I stood looking over my damaged home and tried to forget the sweetness of life on earth. You can't really just drop that into a novel. You know, it sounds kind of cheesy. Um, yeah, yeah, but you, yeah. you can have a character in a graphic novel say it. Yeah. So it began to seem more and more important to the novel. And also, if we're being honest here, titles are really hard. It's really hard to come up with a with a good title. So I love the sound of Station Eleven. Yeah, in um, in Station Eleven, there's a group of artists, uh, both actors and musicians. They're called the Traveling Symphony, and they travel around in the uh, let's say the post-apocalyptic world. Um, uh, after after the, the pandemic, and they're performing Shakespeare, and they're performing Bach, uh, and other great composers. Perhaps they're not all mentioned by name, but uh, they they seem to point at sort of the endurance of art. Is that something uh, partly of a message that you wanted to uh, to bring forward? I don't know if it's so much a message as a core value that I hold. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the, uh, the line that's painted on the side of the symphonies, uh, the symphonies uh, caravans, rather, is survival is insufficient, which is a quote from Star Trek. And when I heard that line on that Star Trek episode in 1999 or 2000, it just struck me as the most elegant expression of something that I believe to be true which is that, of course, survival is never enough. And that's why we have things like books and music. And I have to say that's something that I've found myself thinking about lately in our current situation. 
where during that period in April when the pandemic was raging in the city and it was quite difficult to work, it was still possible to read. And I can't express what it meant to me to read fiction, you know, to just find myself immersed in, in a different world and maybe a more expansive one than being stuck in my house for two months. So, yeah, it's um, art has been so important in my life. I think that's why it keeps resurfacing in the novels. Yeah, it's also stressed in the, in the, in the novel, I think, the importance of, let's say, civilization of the past. Uh, there is this museum of civilization that one of the characters, Clark, uh, is, is sort of supervising, um, uh, well, the graphic novel uh, of, of Miranda, which is sought after uh, by, by, by uh, survivors, so to speak, of, of the ap apocalypse, uh, because it's still something of the past. There are characters looking for uh, gossip magazines about the mm -hmm. past, etc. So both, let's say, uh, on the higher and, the, and the perhaps more low, uh, lower level, um, they are interested in in the world of the past. Uh, uh, what's uh, what's to be said about that? Right, right. I think there are a few ideas at play there. When I was thinking about the Museum of Civilization in that airport, I was trying to place myself into the minds of these people who are suddenly stranded in an airport and realize they're never going to leave. A plane's never going to take off again. Yeah. So imagine yourself there, camped out in the terminal realizing that you've flown into an entirely new world and that everything's different and the old world's not coming back. What are you going to do with your iPhone? You know, it's, um, it's useless. You can't plug it in, but you're not throwing out that precious artifact, the lost world. I think I'd want to put it on a shelf and be able to look at it sometimes. So it seemed to me that creating that museum would just be a very natural human thing for people, yeah. for people in that world. Yeah. And then Something that really interested me as I was thinking about what survives, broadly speaking, and then also what survives the calamity of Station Eleven, of the flu pandemic, is just the randomness of it, you know, the randomness of what survives. We have a lot of Shakespeare plays, but scholars think that there are others that were just lost over the centuries. Right, yeah. So why do we have love's labor lost, but love's labor found, which is thought to have existed, didn't make it. Um, there, there's just such randomness to it. So I liked the idea that, you know, that um, Shakespeare's plays would have survived into this new world, along with the Beethoven and the Bach, but perhaps also a self-published comic book could have deep meaning to some writer, to some, uh, to some people in that world. Yeah. And then um, further to that, you know, you made an interesting point about sort of high versus low culture. I think that what we tend to lose sight of with Shakespeare is that that was the popular entertainment of the day. We, um, right. we, yep. we have a tendency to think of Shakespeare in these incredibly elitist terms. You know, if you say, oh, I'm going to a Shakespeare play, people are like, wow. Um, but, you know, that was, that was the television. That was, uh, that was for the people. So... I, I like the idea of, uh, of, you know, trying to collapse that a little bit. One of the very interesting things about your books is the way they're shaped, basically their structure. They're not, uh, let's say, traditional uh, books that start at the beginning and, and the end. Um, but we get a lot of um, flashbacks. We get perhaps may, maybe not flash forwards, but anyway, references to future events, which, uh, which evoke a certain tension, etc. Um, one thing that becomes clear to me as a writer is this, like, either this must take an enormous lot of planning or it must take an enormous lot of rewriting or a brilliant mind or I don't know what, <laughs> but uh, you've got continu uh, continu continuity problems probably uh, when you, sh you move back and forwards in time. How do you do it? <laughs> And why um, do you do it, Pat? Why do I do it? Uh, the why is easier. I'm not sure that I know how to write a linear novel. I've, I've written right. five novels, and they all move wildly around in time with different points of view. And that seems to just be the most natural way for me to tell a story. Um, it, it's also, I have to say, an interesting way for me to tell a story. I love that. I love the feeling of putting together a giant jigsaw puzzle, trying to see you know, the order of sections and where characters recur. Um, how I do it, there is no planning. It's just endless revision. So I'll, I'll just kind of wing it. I, I just start with a scene. I start writing it. That turns into a chapter. I begin to have some idea of characters. It gets longer and longer. 
I'll lose sight of where I was going and start writing something completely different and with the idea that I can figure out later how it all fits together. And then after about a year of this, I have the most unbelievably messy first draft. It's fairly incoherent at that point. And yeah. I really find the novel in the revisions. For me, the, the first draft, it's like the block of stone in which the sculpture finds you know, the, the, the final thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just go over it uh, dozens of times over a period of years. And as I'm reading it, at first, I'm trying to solve massive problems. You know how first drafts are. You know, the, uh, the decade will change between pages six and seven. Um, so at first, you fix the massive problems and the smaller problems. And the whole way, every time I'm going over it, I'm trying to further refine it to create connections between sections and characters and figure out which order things should go in for a maximum degree of, of effect of narrative tension. So yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's all revision for me. Yeah. Okay. So that is a, but because you, 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 you don't like sort of to plot things in advance. You like to let it, let things happen while you're in the writing process. I do. With negatives, I'd have to say, you know, the negative is, truly is catastrophic. It's a, it's a terrible mess. Um, on the positive side, there is a real possibility of surprise if you're not working from an outline. So, you know, with the Glass Hotel, maybe that was most notable. I was, my original idea for that book was to write about a Ponzi scheme, a massive white collar crime. Yeah, I was fascinated. The, 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 the term uh, Ponzi scheme. for the Oh, yeah. Audience. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, a Ponzi scheme is a fake investment scheme. So if, as an investor, you were drawn into a Ponzi scheme, you would give your investment money to uh, the investor. But instead of investing it, he would give it to people who'd already invested and tell them that those were their returns. And so the people who invested first get the most amount of money, and it trickles down until it all falls apart. So I, w I was fascinated by the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme, which um, Madoff, that was the biggest financial fraud, definitely, definitely the biggest Ponzi scheme in American history, a 65 billion with a B dollar US uh, Ponzi scheme that collapsed in 2008. And although all of the characters in the Glass Hotel are fictional, that, that was the central crime that I based it on. So to return to the question of process, my idea had been to write a novel that was very tightly focused on a massive financial crime. But then this ghost story element started creeping into it. And then, you know, by the time it was done, I had this book, which it's quite difficult to describe The Glass Hotel. Um, it could reasonably be described as a ghost story with a crime in it rather than a crime novel. So, you know, that's, uh, that is one of the positive things about working without an outline is sometimes a book can veer off on an unexpected and possibly more interesting direction you said a, a ghost story there are there is in station 11 there's a little scene it was one scene perhaps with a ghostly kind of uh, 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 nature there is some discussion about the existence of ghosts uh, but in uh, uh, the glass hotel it's very obvious it's a constantly recurring theme uh, many characters are in some way or other haunted or have visions um, when, when and why did this moment uh, arrive that you thought, well, I, I actually want to write a ghost story, which is, of course, a very long tradition with some very respectable examples, you know, very respectable mm -hmm. books with the, the, the popular theme of ghost stories. When, when and why did you decide that you would want to use that sort of format? Well, the way it started was... I was imagining this character, this criminal, Jonathan, who runs the, uh, the fraud in the book. I was imagining that perhaps he was haunted in prison by the ghosts of some of his investors who died following the scheme, who committed suicide or you know, other things that happened to them. So it started with that. And the way I tried to write it originally was to try to make it a bit ambiguous. So it's not really clear if he's seen actual ghosts, if you can use the word actual in relation to a ghost or if it's really a product of a deteriorating mental state. So it began with that, but then 
I just found myself more and more interested in writing a ghost story, which, you know, it's a form that I love. I've been reading it my whole life. Right. And once I'd committed to that, then it became kind of interesting to me to think, well, what is a ghost story? Because when we use that phrase, we tend to think of it in somewhat classical terms. You know, you, you hear the words ghost story and you think of this sort of spectral figure, you know, transparent to the hallway of a dark old house, like that kind of thing. Um, but it's interesting to think about different ways of being haunted. You know, none of us made it to adulthood, let alone middle age, without being somewhat haunted by the things we wish we'd said or hadn't said or done or hadn't done. You know, and I was thinking, well, isn't that a kind of haunting, the way our brains kind of return to that over and over again? Or the idea that's also played out for Jonathan in prison of the counter life. That's your counterfactual life, or the life where you went to a different school or married a different instead of staying or vice versa. And it's interesting to imagine the idea that perhaps our lives are haunted by our, by our counter lives which is to say haunted by the ghosts of the lives we didn't lead. So, you know, once I committed to that idea, I, I tried to set up the book so that every section is concerned in some way with some kind of hauntedness, you know, as, a, as an organizing principle. And it, yeah, it just, uh, it just took over the project. I found it more and more interesting. Yes, the idea of a counter life or a parallel universe, and there are some other terms used for that in the book. It's it's a constant. It's a constant. It's something. Uh, it's very much one might see one one might say one of the themes of the book. The idea that things might have gone this way, but it might have gone the other way as well. Um, and in fact, there's a little, a nice little reference in which uh, one of the characters says, "Well." What if this Georgia flu, which is so important in Station Eleven, of course, if it hadn't been uh, contained in such an early stage, but had been a right. real disaster, what would have happened? Which is, of course, very nice for every reader of Station Eleven. <laughs> right. You all know what happened. <laughs> right. yeah. um, and so the idea of, 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 of uh, parallel universes is very uh, alive and very important to several of your characters, right? It is. It is. It's an idea that fascinates me. Um, yeah, j just imagining the counterfactuals, you know, as historians put it, um, you can think of the massive counterfactuals, you know, what if, what if Germany had won the first world war, how different European history might look, um, or you can think of the, the sort of ancestral ones, I guess, um, you know, suppose that one of my great grandparents hadn't emigrated from London, you know, that kind of thing, or, um, or the personal ones, which are maybe, the most obvious, maybe the most interesting to us personally, because it's our lives. You know, what if you had married somebody else? Or if you hadn't been at the party where you met your future spouse, like that, those moments. Um, yeah, these are ideas that I'm drawn to. And maybe it's just a function of being a novelist, that we're always thinking about counterfactuals, because we're always composing lives and narratives. This is part of the nature of our work. Now, um, one interesting aspect is that in, in both your novels, you um, devote quite a bit of attention to what is normally uh, in our lives a rather uh, obscure, uh, 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 well, uh, element, uh, obscure world, basically, that is the world of international shipping, which uh, is, is, you know, it's, it's in both books and it gets, its, it gets a fair share of the book. Uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, it's also something well, I never thought about that. Um, right. Maybe that's the reason, but it's, it's interesting that it <laughs> comes back in both books, this sh so more or less shadowy kind of world of international shipping. Yeah, um, I first came across that world over 10 years ago. I think, it was, I think it was an article that I read in 2009 in the Daily Mail. I want to say the writer was Simon Perry, and the... Um, the title of the piece was something like the ghost fleet of the Re of the recession and he was describing this very strange kind of surreal situation where given the 2008 2009 economic collapse there was just no demand for ships because if nobody's buying anything then those things don't need to be shipped across oceans so this left the shipping companies with a bit of a quandary. You know, where do we put them? Um, they don't just sit at port, they're always in motion. So 
uh, they'd come up with this very strange solution, which was a fleet of disused sh uh, ships from various companies had appeared almost overnight, anchored about 100 miles south of Singapore Harbor. Nice. So the experience of, uh, of the people in the fishing village, just uh, you know, across from that, is all of a sudden these boats appear on the horizon. They're lit up at night like a ghost city. And there was something kind of spooky and beautiful about that and then the imagery that accompanied the article. So that wow. was where I first started thinking about it. And I think what interests me about shipping is, as you alluded to, we don't think about it. It's an invisible world. And what's interesting to me is the combination of invisibility and scale, where an incredible number of the things on and around us came to us over the ocean. You know, yeah. So much of what we consume in the United States and Canada was made in China uh, or made in Vietnam. Um, and we just don't think of the way these goods come to us, you know, this constant movement of goods over oceans. We certainly don't think about the people who, you know, piloted your shoes through the Panama Canal, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think it's that the combination of invisibility and scale, the way there's this secret world that's almost so vast that it becomes invisible. I, I think that's what draws me to it. It's, uh, it's such an enormous part of our, of our economic world and one that we just never think about. It's not just uh, the, the subject of the shipping industry, but also two characters, obviously Miranda and Leon, who travel, so to speak, with, uh, with the shipping uh, world from uh, Station 11 to, uh, to the Glass Hotel. You so you decided that you wanted to use these characters again, didn't you? I did, I did. And that's partly where the, uh, the stuff about alternate universes came into play. You know, all of my books stand alone. They don't need to be read in any particular order. But I do occasionally become um, attached to characters, and I want to use them again somewhere else. So with Station Eleven, I became quite attached to Miranda, which, and you know, once, yeah, with Miranda and then Leon, although he is quite a small figure in Station Eleven. Um, I don't want to spoil Station Eleven too terribly for people who haven't read it, but let's just just say there's a very big impediment to using Miranda again in a future book after uh, what happens to her in Station Eleven. So I tried to lay the groundwork in Station Eleven for this idea of alternate universes. There's a post-apocalyptic chapter toward the end of the book where two characters are resting by the road and they're playing a game that they've clearly been playing for years where they just kind of riff on ideas about alternate universes an alternate universe where the Georgia flu never happened, for example. And then I tried to mirror that in the Glass Hotel with that, that section you mentioned earlier where Vincent is saying, you know, imagine an alternate universe where that flu hadn't been quite so swiftly contained. So I was trying to lay the groundwork there to reuse Miranda and Leon in the Glass Hotel because I, I did really like them. And yeah, tr trying to set up the idea that the, the books exist kind of in parallel. You know, the, the universe of Station Eleven is not exactly the same universe as the Glass Hotel, even though two characters recur. That's right, yeah. And with uh, Miranda, you, you, we have a very memorable, memorable character of, uh, of the book uh, Station Eleven. Vincent, as you just mentioned, she is another, uh, it's, it's a she, maybe we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, she is also a very memorable character, although very different, in, uh, in the Glass Hotel. Uh, maybe we should, we know, you tell us that her mother uh, uh, called her after the American poet at now St. Vincent Millay. Uh, does, does this poet have any significance for you? Is she a favorite poet, poet of yours? She is a favorite poet, and uh, she's a poet whose character I would say, I was going to say whose character I admire. Um, I read a biography of her a number of years ago. It's fantastic if anybody's interested. It's called uh, Savage Beauty. And it is a somewhat mixed depiction of her character. She could be cruel. But I think what drew me to her was, um, you know, she was somebody who grew up in really intense poverty. I was a single mother, three daughters. All of them were working. It was very difficult. Um, and she kind of elevated herself out of that by sheer force of will and by sheer talent. Mm 
She wrote a poem when she was 17 years old, which through a convoluted chain of events landed her at an excellent college. And then from there into Greenwich Village in New York City, a sort of bohemian hub of the time, where she just kind of got the life that she imagined. And I, uh, I think I always admired that, that self-determination, that, fo- that sort of force of will. And also the poem was magnificent. Um, yeah, so I admire her work and I admire that willpower and that act. Yeah. And the person she's, uh, that, that, that gets her name, Vincent in the, in the novel, she is one of the characters who is constantly able to reinvent herself. She's, she's a, a, a waitress in a cocktail bar at a certain moment, then she becomes a trophy wife of this mm-hmm. rich uh, Ponzi scheme guy, so to speak. And later on, she uh, has. Uh, well, sorry, she, she she works on she works on a, on, on a ship, and there are other things as well. I think she's um, uh, she's uh, she's a video artist, of course. That's also something uh, which is which play, uh, plays a, a part in the in the, in the in the novel. And she's just one of the characters who seem to be able to reinvent uh, one, uh, him or herself. Goes for Leon, her former executive, for later becomes something like. A jack of all trades, I suppose. <laughs> right. Well, half brother right. Paul. Uh, he, uh, well, he. There are moments when he is a failed student or a failed bar, uh, a failed night, uh, night, night uh, concierge, whatever. And sometimes, then he's a famous or at least a successful musician using mm-hmm. the video art of his sister. And later on, he's down again, and he's a he's a drug addict. And and so there are a number of characters. Jeevan is, is an example as well, mm-hmm. um, who have various careers, perhaps various lives. So even within the same universe, they seem to have multiple lives in a way. (laughs) It's true. Yeah. Um, It may have something to do with my having trained as a dancer and now I'm a novelist. I have, I have no training as a novelist. That was a new life I invented. Um, I suppose it's also that I see that so often around me. Uh, One of my very good friends is a therapist who, when I met him, he was doing stand-up comedy and had a band, you know, so I, uh, I feel like we live so many different lives during the course of our adult lives these days, perhaps much more so than say my grandparents would have, where, you know, you had one or two or maybe three jobs in your entire life and you stuck to one of, you know, to each one of them for decades. We're, uh, we're so fluid now in terms of what we do with our lives. So, yeah, I, I do find myself drawn to that. Um, I remember when Station Eleven came out, getting a fair amount of criticism from some reviewers about Jeevan's transformation from, I think he's like an entertainment writer at the beginning of the yeah. book, who becomes an, a, a, an ambulance person. driver. And, and that, yeah, yeah, and... Uh, it, uh, you know, that doesn't seem weirder to me than having gone to school for contemporary dance and now writing novels. <laughs> right, right. Although we, we like to think in our country, I guess in, in Europe, that it's also a very American thing uh, that you're always able to reinvent yourself. <laughs> right. To you recognize that that's yeah. a North American <laughs> thing. <laughs> I think it's more American. Um, you know, Canada too, but there's a level of uh, hustle, you know, for lack of a better word, in the United States, which has to do, I think, with this being a comparatively difficult country to live in. Um, You know, Canada has a much stronger social safety net. It's just, it's not as hard a country as the U.S. is. Right. And, you know, with the U.S., there's just such a high degree of risk um, that I think it gives people this kind of uh, nervous energy. (laughs) I don't know. But, yeah, it is possible that that reinvention is, uh, is something that people do more readily here. I'm not sure. Right. I have uh, two questions from from the audience, which which came in uh, through uh, a chat. The first one is, uh, what were your thoughts when you heard a pandemic was upon us? Um, probably the same as everyone else. I mean, when I was writing Station Eleven, I did do a fair amount of research into the history of pandemics. And something that does become clear when you read about them is that they are something that happens to us as a species. And that is not to minimize the awfulness of our present moment in any way, but all of, our, all of us are descended from people who survived one pandemic or another. You know, it is this kind of recurring, it's a recurring part of the human condition. 
So maybe that helped a little bit, but, but also, you know, I think I had the same anxieties as everybody else. Uh, will the schools close? Are we safe? Will we be able to get groceries? It's just the logistics of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The second question is as follows. As an aspiring writer, I wonder, do you wait for inspiration before you start writing? You said things develop while you are writing, but does it always happen? Uh, or can you force yourself to lead yourself towards a situation where you're able to write? Your stories are so creative that I wonder how this creativity works for you in your writing process. I think you have to approach it as a job you know, in the most unglamorous way possible, is my personal opinion. Um, I've always felt like if I waited for inspiration, I'd never get any work done. I, I think that forcing yourself, which sounds so negative, but that is the truth of the matter, to just sit down and work is probably the way to go. Something that I've personally found very helpful in that is reconciling yourself to the idea that your first draft will be, will be bad. You know, that's what first drafts are for. Yeah. So, you know, you're very unlikely to sit down and write something dazzlingly brilliant, but that's not the point of the first draft. The point of the first draft is just to get something on paper, which you can then refine. So yeah, I think, um, I think doing it as often as you can is really helpful. Something that I personally found very useful as a younger writer starting out was uh, trying to train myself to write as often as I could and also under any circumstances. You know, it's, it's easy to get a little bit precious about one's writing environment. You know, you, uh, you meet writers who will say, oh, I can only write in my office at home. Yeah. Well, what if all the time you have is half an hour in a coffee shop during your lunch break at your job? You know, just, just sit down and do some writing and it makes it a better day in my experience. Wonderful. Well, these are the two questions that uh, came from the audience. Uh, I think actually we've, uh, we are through, we're, uh, we're, we've passed our 45 minute time slot. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to thank you very much from, uh, yeah, from uh, New York for your, uh, for your answering our questions here from the Netherlands. Uh, I would like to encourage people in the Netherlands indeed to, uh, to buy your two books that are in translation and perhaps the other ones, the first three ones are also in their original American edition or the Canadian edition uh, available. Uh, I think probably Megan will now uh, take over from the organization. I'd like to thank you very much once again for being with us here tonight. And I really hope that one day, one day, yes, of course, you'll be able to come to us in person. I would love to. I would love to. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much.